I want to move on very quickly, if I may, to talk about Mohammed Al Fayed. As you've probably heard by now, the former Harrods owner died at the age of 94. Now, Mohammed Al Fayed is someone who I'm very familiar with. I think many people of my age are very familiar with him indeed. Of course, he was the former Harrods boss. His son Dodi was killed in a car crash alongside Diana, Princess of Wales. Uh, he died, as I said, at the age of 94. He had the most extraordinary story, actually. He was born in Egypt and he built a business empire in the Middle East before he moved to the UK in the 1970s. However, the sadness for him is that he never realised his ambition to gain a passport for his adopted country. There is a lot to this story, how it's really a rags to, um, a, a rags to riches story. It's an extraordinary story and tinged with sadness, regret and obviously that terrible uh, accident and, and car crash. And I'm delighted to say that actually Michael Cole, former spokesman for Mohammed Al Fayed, joins us this morning. Good morning. Good morning, David. Thank you for that uh, brief tribute to Mohammed because he was an extraordinary man. Um, it may interest your many viewers and listeners to know that he actually died on Wednesday, which was the day before the 26th anniversary of the death of his beloved oldest son, Dodi, and family's dear friend, Diana, Princess of Wales. And he was entombed yesterday, the day after that uh, anniversary, in a mausoleum alongside uh, Dodi. Uh, it's a very sad day for many, many people, um, including myself. I knew him for 37 years. Yeah. I worked for him for 10 years. Uh, he was a remarkable person, larger than life, uh, full of uh, vim and vigor. And um, he touched many people's lives. Uh, his uh, staff really liked him, really adored him in many ways, and, and the customers who knew him uh, got to like him, and of course the football fans at, at Fulham Football Club. Mm. He attracted many critics, but I always felt that he did more good in the world than all his critics put together. Mm. He had a really extraordinary story. He started selling fizzy drinks on the streets of his native Alexandria in Egypt. He then had a change in fortune, didn't he? And of course, he then moved to Britain in 1974. And I think this is where I remember him from. Uh, he obviously then bought the Ritz Hotel in Paris with his brother Ali for 20 million. They then took over Harrods in 1985. They bought that for an amazing 615 million pounds. And that's, I think, where he came to prominence in the British psyche. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, as his brother once said to me, we had the same planes, we had the same homes, we had the same uh, luxuries, we had the same everything before we bought Harrods, but because when we bought Harrods, we then became prominent people mm. in Britain. You mentioned um, the passport, and this okay. is an interesting thing. I mean, he was married to a, a Finnish lady, a charming lady called Haney, who, of course, Finland is part of the European Union. His four younger children were all born in Britain, uh, but he was declined uh, his application for naturalization as a British subject. And that happened uh, four months after he'd made revelations uh, about sleaze within the John Major government, which led to the resignation of uh, three ministers and the imprisonment of one. So it looked very much to me, because somebody who had brought so much wealth to this country and served this country well, that it was revenge. I remember the very nice Filipino boy who used to park the cars at Harrods Car Park saying to me, why hasn't Mr. Alfai got a passport? I've got a passport. Uh, I've been here and my son is my wife uh, and we are now British citizens. It was, um, it was a, a little bit of nastiness on, on their part, um, but he lived with it. He was very proud to be an Egyptian. He often uh, recounted the great achievements and, uh, and uh, resources uh, and inventions of, of the Egyptians going way back to the mm. pharaohs. So he wasn't, he wasn't uh, uh, ashamed of being an Egyptian, quite the reverse. He was proud of it, but it made it so much easier moving around the world, even in your private jet, if you have a British passport rather than an Egyptian one. Mm. And you touched on his remarkable achievements owning football, uh, Fulham Football Club. Also, he, he had a huge interest in charities, didn't he, in Great Ormond Street particularly? Well, it's interesting that you should say that because most of the things he ever did, nobody ever knew about. 
I mean, I can only tell you the number of, of cases of people with terminally ill children or people in real trouble who he came to him and quite anonymously, I sometimes said to him, why do you do all this stuff? And mm -hmm. he said, you know, if you do the right thing, you'll come back with something good. And I said, Mohammed, that is Buddhism. It's not Islam. It's not mm. Christianity. He said, but he said in the Bible or the Quran, it says, do good. Uh, and if you do good, good things will happen to you. He, he, he endowed the first scanner, the MRI machine. He couldn't believe that um, Great Ormond Street Hospital, the most famous children's hospital in the world, didn't have one. Mm. He got to know the hospital because his, uh, his son, Karim, contracted meningitis in the south of France, and he was treated at the hospital. Mohammed slept at the hospital night after night. And when they said they didn't have an MRI, um, this was 30 years ago, he, he bought one outright from Siemens of Germany. I think it was eight million pounds. It was the biggest single donation from a human being uh, ever. They had they obviously raised the Wishing Well Fund, raised 32 million, I believe. But from a single donor, eight million pounds, and then he paid for upgrades to make it more effective and, and more useful. He was a great believer in children's charities. He was a great humanitarian. He was never happier than when he was with his own grandchildren or taking other children around Harrah's uh, at the uh, Father Christmas. He instituted that, of course. London didn't have a Christmas parade uh, until he started one with Father Christmas arriving with reindeers and <laughs> snow and all the rest of it at Harrods, and that became a tradition. We didn't have that. It was like Macy's Parade. Mm. And thousands of people who were not ever going to step inside the shop uh, came just to enjoy it and bring their children. Mm, an extraordinary man. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Really good to talk to you. Thank you for your time this morning.